Hi, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 684th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe, Director of Programs here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Sarah Friend and Charlotte Kent. We're thrilled to welcome poet Eleni Sicilianos here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for actual necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land that we're speaking from. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest and host. Based in Berlin, Sarah Friend is an artist and software developer. She's currently visiting chair of blockchain art at the Cooper Union. She was the recipient of the 30 Under 30 Developers in Canada Award and the GDC Scholarship for Women in Games. She's had work commissioned by Furtherfield, London, and Neon Festival Dundee, as well as the HEK Basel, Basel, and Unfinished NYC. Assistant Professor of Visual Culture at Montclair State University, Charlotte Kent, has a particular interest in historical frameworks for artistic practices, with a research focus on contemporary digital culture and the absurd. She writes for assorted magazines and various academic journals, and we're lucky to have her as an editor at large at the Brooklyn Rail. And with that, it's my pleasure to pass it over to you, Charlotte. Thank you, Chloe. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, thank you, Sarah, for being here. It is such an honor. I have had the pleasure of knowing about Sarah's work for several years. Um, you know, before blockchain became a thing that everyone was like trying to fumble. Just yesterday, I got asked if I would explain what an NTF was. Um, and, you know, NFTs got people sort of mixing up new acronyms and um, wondering why everyone was on Twitter again. Um, I knew about Sarah's work and was really interested in it in terms of some of its, you know, really rich conceptual underpinnings. Um, I had not gotten a chance to meet her and this occasion of terraforming came up and I was just thrilled when um, the rail agreed that this would be a great conversation for us to have. And so now I get to be in conversation with you, Sarah. So thank you for joining. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. And I've also known about your work for a very long time. I think from, yeah, you, you've been writing about blockchain for, well, since before this hype wave. And um, yeah, it's great to finally meet on Zoom. Yeah. Um, so there's a show terraforming that's happening in Berlin, um, and I am really excited to go see it shortly. Um, so I'm having a conversation about it before I've seen it, which is often an unusual experience. Um, but that puts me somewhat in the uh, shoes that many of you may be in as well. Um, and I will do my best to report back on how fabulous I have no doubt that it is. Um, one of the things I really wanted to, you know, Sort of dive into a little bit with so many of the ideas that are in this show because um, that's just something that's been really important in your work and you titled the show terraforming and I think it's if we could just even go to the first slide to get a chance to, just so that audiences can start to see there's going to be a lot of different um, uh, formulations if you will like material embodiments of some of these ideas that are expressed in this show but let's just start with this title terraforming people tend to think of this um technology so frequently as being um you know clouds and ephemeral and you know not really there so why terraforming why was this the concept to do your first solo show with Nigel Draxler <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to start here. I sometimes feel it's the best place to start with this exhibition, actually. Um, and also, I moved my microphone a little closer to where I'm speaking. I hope that helps. I saw a comment in the chat that I'm not loud enough. Um, so the title Terraforming, uh, it has a few references that um, I think are um, bare on the work. Um, of course, there's the most obvious one we know of the word used for, um, sort of the context of terraforming another planet to be more like Earth, um, as seen maybe in Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars Trilogy best. Um, but there's also um, a programming language called Terraform. 
Um, and that uh, is an infrastructure as code tool, which is used to uh, create, update, and destroy remote computers. Um, and I, I mean, it's probably working off an analogy that these computers are a kind of landscape that are being um, shaped by what's specified using this tool. Um, but I think there's a lot of irony to that name. Um, and one of something I come back to in my work often is how um, the metaphors we use to talk about computing are often so much more accurate than their intent that their their creators even intend. Um, so while we are creating, updating, and destroying this remote computing infrastructure using a tool called Terraform, um, you know, we also uh, need to be confronted um, or are actively engaging in um, a process which has climate impacts and participates in the terraforming of the planet we're living on now. Um, and so and I'm not the first person to note this, not even by, not even close. Um, so I also came across this sort of fabulous quote from Ingrid Burrington, who I think is a New York based, or often has been a New York based uh, researcher who's done a lot of work on internet infrastructure. Um, and she has this quote that the internet is um, already the largest terraforming project ever constructed. Um, so the exhibition is about internet infrastructure and cryptocurrency mining infrastructure in a lot of layers. Um, so I thought that pulling in this um, metaphor um, for the climate context of that um, was a helpful place to start. Totally. In fact, just um, Ingrid wrote a book uh, for those who are based in New York and sort of you know want to get a sense of this from a um, home ground basis. She has this book, uh, The Networks of New York, where she really looks at the digital infrastructure specifically in uh, New York City. So you get a sense of um, how, like this idea of how it's implicated, you know, how it's implicated within the way the uh, landmass is being managed and manipulated, um, but also gives you a good sense of just in general, some of the ideas that Sarah was just talking about, because you can sort of extrapolate out to how this is true in other places and globally. Um, there was a lot you just mentioned. So I'm just thinking uh, to go backwards a little bit. Uh, I think maybe we'll start with this idea of um, the way in which some of the metaphors and some of the language around this winds up, you know, using uh, natural language terms in a way that is meant to somehow both be familiar, but also defam like make it possible not to think about the actual impact. Um, and then I definitely want to get to this program you were just talking about, because that seems quite interesting and, and even maybe a little scary. But so clouds, right? Everything's in the cloud. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and, you know, we're mining, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there's this notion of mining, and that's exactly what Ingrid's talking about, like this huge impact. Um, you know, server farms, um, yeah. this farming concept, right? And and I know, of course, you're not the only person to talk about this. We spoke with John Gerard about some of these ideas as well. But um, when you were sort of noticing, you know, this accumulation of... Uh, agricultural language, if you will. Um, what worried you or what struck you about it? Like, what was the sort of response you had? Because it's something you've dealt with since like, at least click mine, if not before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the response is usually, mm, yeah, kind of, that those terms as an artist give us space for play mm. somehow. Like um, the people who called cryptocurrency mining, mining probably weren't thinking about minerals, for example, but um, there's something to pull in or in usefulness of what they did accidentally as an artist, you know? Um, in terms of uh, sort of, uh, and I feel the same way about um, 
terraform in this context. I, I really doubt that people who, um, I'm getting more comments that I'm quiet. Um, I am speaking loudly and I'm quite close to my mic. So I'm gonna crank the levels actually, sorry. If I can. Really fine. As you're doing that, I'll just mention, um, you know, just even because we're both, you know, professors, like in my own class this week, I was walking students through um, from culture jamming and these ads that had been done around Apple iPods uh, and uh, Foxconn, right? And so walking students through sort of recognizing the, like what well, we know about the mines that are, you know, the mining that happens in Africa to extract cobalt and some of the other mi uh, minerals that are necessary for the literal hardware of our mobile devices, um, how those then get taken to China and are put together into our fancy sleek little phones um, at various factories that have had uh, significant reporting on some of the human rights questions um, and labor practices that are going on there. And then all the way back to Silicon Valley with Andrew Norman Wilson's um, workers leaving the Googleplex um, and just recognizing that it's even like these, you know, the, the material infrastructure is, is, is all looped in and it has a sort of global circuit. Um, and so, and I say that because uh, I do this in my class on ideology, and I think it's interesting because, you know, were they thinking of it when they decided to call something terraform? Um, maybe not, but that's also precisely how society leaks into, like how things that are valued and being thought through unconsciously in a society appear in actual form, right? Language as form. Um, I often say the metaphor is not an accident, but maybe we could say they're like the Freudian slips of tech speaking about, you know, its foundations. Also, I cranked my microphone. I hope it's helping. <laughs> um, it's, it's definitely much louder on my end. So uh, I just, uh, maybe it is for other people as well. We'll, we'll get notes in the chat. Um, so, I mean, just to keep going with this, right? So maybe we can look at one of the next images. Um, we'll sort of, eventually we'll sort of have circuited a little bit around this. Um, you, you had this, um, I think if, if what I'm thinking of is what's coming up um, with the next image. The, you had this quote apparently in the entryway um, the world itself never asks whether whether it is based on a principle of competition or cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Chloe, could we go to the next one? Um, and I was thinking about that oddly in relationship to this image, which you titled Defense Mechanism, mm -hmm. um, because so much of the conversation around both cooperation and competition is often framed as a form of like human defense. Like the only reason people collaborate is because it actually works out better for them. Or the only, the reason people compete is because it works out better for them. And mm -hmm. so uh, just with some of those ideas in mind, can you tell us a little bit about this work that is an air filter and plexiglass and stickers? <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, so first I want to say that the quote in the door is not my writing. Um, it's from a text called One Straw Revolution by uh, Masanobu Fukuoka. Uh, and it's about uh, permaculture farming. Um, most of the book is about farming techniques. I actually give some hands-on gardening advice, um, but it has this like really beautiful passage at the end. Um, we're sort of in a Zen-like way, he's observing this question, an old enough one that it was present at the time the book was written too. Um, and it is, it, you know, is nature fundamentally competitive or cooperative? Um, and I think this is a question we can ask in a lot of places. And it's definitely a question people ask regularly now, um, even still with sort of, you know, emerging research about mycelial networks or soil microbiology. Um, and he's observing actually that these concepts entirely uh, of cooperation and competition are um, actually purely human constructs that are projected 
onto nature. Um, nature itself never asks whether it's based upon a principle, you know? Um, and I, I think that the question itself actually is nature fundamentally competitive or cooperative actually operates best as a mirror. Um, it says more about the answer, says more about its human askers than anything in, a, in nature itself. Um, so this is why we start with this question <laughs> for the whole exhibition. Um, but this work we're looking at um, is called Defense Mechanism. Um, one of the things running through this show in a lot of places is game theory, um, mechanism design is very important uh, in the blockchain world. Um, and this, this is a used air filter. Part of my research for the exhibition involved um, contacting every data center in Berlin uh, and asking them if I could go and visit or if they would meet with me or give me any information about what they're doing. And all of them said no, except for one. One data center let me in. They gave me a tour of their facility. They chatted to me quite a bit about data centers in Berlin and German context. And they also let me have a bunch of stuff that they were getting rid of. Um, so <laughs> this, uh, you know, one of those moments where being an artist just involves doing the weirdest stuff ever. And you're like, hey, can I, um, you know, those air filters that you change, are you throwing them out? Can I, can I just like have your garbage? <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, they said yes. So I have a bunch of air filters. This, is, this air filter is actually from a data center in Berlin. And um, I, I feel like that's quite important, you know, it's like the, it's not just any dirt, this is the authentic dirt. Um, and I really, really wanted the air filters in the exhibition, um, kind of because of this context of terraforming and bringing in the climate layer. Um, the, the dirt of Berlin forms a kind of spore print of place, you know, and, um, is also making very visible um, some, a key part of what the data center is doing, um, which is cooling itself, dissipating heat. Um, when we're talking about climate, we're often talking about the atmosphere. Um, and I feel like the, there's this, parallel um, imaginary between the atmosphere and computing infrastructure, which we see in terms like the cloud and in Ethereum. Um, and both of them, both the atmosphere and the internet are things which kind of encircle the planet, are all around us. Um, existing at tremendous scale, but somehow invisible also. Um, and interdependent as well, when we're talking about the climate impacts of um, computing. Um, so anyway, this air filter kind of like the, the, the used air filter from the data center is really like pulling in and kind of like object metaphor modality. Uh, for me, a lot of those, um, sort of themes. And then the, the sort of sticker image. Um, one of the other works in the show is uh, uh, a, there's grids used a lot um, mm -hmm. in the exhibition. I won't talk too much about the other work, but we're looking at this one. <laughs> um, but then we also have the, um, the a fan piece. So the sticker pattern and the air filter are all sort of, echoing these themes used in the other work in the exhibition as well. I'm wondering if I can just, uh, you you were talking about how there's these things that are invisible, um, right? And it's interesting because uh, immediately, right? It's like th there's this way in which it's made less invisible by the dirt in the air filter, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it would, if, you know, you, and the garbage that you're, that you pulled from this data center, which enables you to make this work that enables it, 
these issues and some of these ideas and some of these concerns that we should all have around what does it mean going forward as technology continues to be a part of our lives. It's not going anywhere, and but we still have choices we can make around how it's going to continue to be developed and designed, right? Like how this garbage, right, can actually be a part of helping us understand, like making visible something. Um, and in, and I think about like how this has been true repeatedly, right? Like various different art projects that have, you know, done this and the way in which, you know, the environmental movement itself has like made an effort to sort of highlight how garbage can help us see things and scholars will study the garbage of, you know, cultures hundreds or thousands of years ago. Like that's actually one of the best ways to learn about the lives of people who are no longer here. Um, and so, you know, I think it's just a sort of interesting, like um, a budding, if I may, of this thing like technology that we think of as so contemporary, almost like it's almost hard to even think of technology as contemporary. There's always a slight futurism that's attached to it. It's like we're almost always somehow slightly futurist when we're engaging with technology. Um, and yet at the same time, um, the way in which uh, dirt, deposit, garbage, Things that, things that are inherently of the past, right? Things that have been discarded can help illuminate this contemporary thing. And so maybe it is worth it. Like, let's go to some of the other grids and so forth, because I feel like um, as we move through this, like this reuse, this sort of adoption of other things that you do across this show really speaks to that. Um, so Chloe, can we go to the, I think it's the next image. Um, we might move around a bit. Yes, uh, another one of the air filters. Um, and here you did this design on it. What was, but it's barely visible, which yeah, I- Yeah, it's difficult. This one's difficult to see in image form. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, also on the subject of garbage, it's very funny doing an exhibition where a lot of the sculptures are made from garbage uh, because, you know, there at the studio. This is always true with an exhibition. You know, you have stuff in your studio and it's just stuff in your studio. And then you like wrap it up in bubble wrap and you like send it to the gallery. And it, it then it has like an alchemical process has happened. And it is like not stuff in your studio anymore. It's like artwork. <laughs> it has it has transformed. But the, that transformation process, which always happens, is particularly funny when it's like a dirty air filter. That's <laughs> you know, um, I'm like, I was not handling this and now I'm bubble wrapping the garbage from the data center to ship it somewhere. Really, really funny moment. Um, so, okay, I have another thing to say about garbage. No, 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 garbage. no, 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 no. <laughs> say more about garbage because I feel like that is, I mean, garbage is the root, it's, it's the, um, not mold, it's, it's the thing on the surface of the soil that leads you know, that allows us to know the layers in which we live. So go ahead, more garbage. <laughs> well, I mean, um, things have to rot in order to grow, mm -hmm. um, of course. Um, but uh, no, it was that another thing that's sort of funny when you're doing an exhibition is how much garbage you make. Mm. Um, so this, there's like some irony here and I haven't necessarily, um, done the exhibition that would deal with it appropriately but this exhibition itself has a ghost in terms of um, all the waste that was produced be that packaging of things I got made or things I ordered online um, and it, there's some irony that this exhibition is about making the waste of another industry visible but the art industry itself is um, and my studio is culpable in producing significant amount of garbage as well. Yeah. So anyway, they're saying, but this image is, is it's really hard to see. And so this work is like um, yeah, quite subtle in photograph form, but it has um, an engraving on a piece of plexiglass in front of the air filter. Um, and the sticker piece had um, plexiglass too. It's kind of window-like a little bit um, as an object maybe. Um, and the image that's engraved on these air filters is a diagram from physics. Um, and it shows um, the way that light is visible um, over time. Um, so 
the di if you want to Google the diagram, you can Google like light cone, cone of the future, things like that, and you'll get like a more easy to view version of what's on the slides. Um, but it kind of has you in, in the center of this triangle, um, and you have a sort of two dimensional projection of space as you experience it. And you have sort of um, a representation of the past and the future. And so there's like a set of things which occurred in the past, which are visible to you based on where you are now and the movements of light in the universe. Um, and then there's also sort of a, a broadening area of places and moments in the future where what we're doing now will be visible as well. Um, so this diagram kind of shows that. Um, why did I think this diagram was interesting in the context of this exhibition? Um, me, 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 me. I have an idea. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, you were saying that and I was just thinking time. Like you and I have chatted before we've ever spoken live like this. Like we've messaged each other because of our mutual interest in time and time scales and timescapes and, um, I feel like that totally speaks to that. You've just been doing a bunch of work on time. Um, totally. And all this puzzle of garbage and waste is very time related also. And, and timely. <laughs> um, I wonder, uh, just because I wanna make sure that people get to see all, you know, all the images as we're talking, even actually I wanna go, I know I'm, I'm going out of order and I apologize, but I actually wanna jump to the next terraforming exhibition view with the video on the ground um, and the flags. Yeah. Um, can you just speak a little bit about this piece? Because one, you've put the screen on the floor and everyone is always terrified of screens on floors because they're gonna break and it's gonna be bad. And, um, and then also of course the flags or this conversation. Anyway, so maybe you could just say a bit about this work. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm pleased to report the screen on the floor. It's not broken. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I'll talk about the video and then I'll talk about the flags. Um, the video, um, I mentioned that I did all this research about data centers um, uh, uh, as part of the exhibition. Um, and I really struggled um, when putting this exhibition together with how to represent the internet or think about the internet um, in some ways. Uh, one of them was that the internet is global. So it's massive. It's existing in um, so many geopolitical contexts um, and embedded within all of those geopolitical contexts um, are specificities, um, historical legacies, um, power, colonialism, histories of conflict, etc. And dealing with the internet in some kind of general sense is very challenging because um, one wants to um, not overgeneralize about um, something so vast um, and complex. Um, and, and we experience differently depending on where you're located, what your access point is, what kind of speed you have I mean it's just it's it all it actually can feel like a different internet totally absolutely um and so just bearing all of that in mind I was uh, uh I didn't know quite where to enter um and I thought about it a lot and eventually arrived at actually just like not even trying on some level to take on uh, all this scale. Uh, so I limited um, my most intensive research at least to uh, the data centers of Berlin. Um, so there are 11 data centers in Berlin, the exhibition is in Berlin and I'm living in Berlin. So it all felt very approachable. Um, and somehow I, um, I also felt like the data centers were at the appropriate scale um, for an exhibition of this uh, 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 size and timeline because they're, they're big enough and they're foreign enough to the domestic experience of using the internet that they, they convey something that we might not feel like we know how to access. It's, it's a scale larger than the home router, you know? 
um, or the ethernet cable. Um, but they're not so vast as to be almost impossible to imagine, like the deep sea cable, you know? They're far away, but they're close enough that you could walk over to one. Um, and, you know, um, so this video uh, is using satellite footage from Google Earth. And there's a lot of irony there. And we can talk about Google Earth as much as we want to and mapping and politics of mapping, because those are all fascinating rabbit holes. Um, yeah. But it flies over all the data centers in Berlin and it presents basically whatever I could learn about them. I nerded out majorly here. Um, and the things that I found about each data center are a little bit different. I learned a lot about the creation of the internet in Berlin, its development, um, especially in the context of reunification of Germany, um, which was, um, in case people don't know, uh, you know, when the Berlin Wall fell, um, the city had to be brought back together in a lot of senses, and also infrastructurally. Um, so the electrical grid, for example, is actually two separate electrical grids. Um, and all of this has impacted uh, the shape of the internet um, in that city today. Um, and really, I guess the main theme of the video is, or maybe how I hope it operates, is this mode of by looking in a very specific and particular way at what is local, we can reveal something true about what is global as well. Um, this sort of, because I have this feeling uh, that any city you took, if you did this kind of research into its, its data centers, you would perhaps learn similar things. They would be different in their particularity, um, but about, you know, why are they where they are, <laughs> you know? Um, so it tells that story in the Berlin context. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing that is often said about um, the particularity of uh, someone's experience, right? Like if, if an artist or writer can be really truly honest about their own totally personal experience, their own real affective and intellectual responses to the world in which they live, there's some things that somehow it seems to like slip through and fold out into an experience that many people can have, right? Um, and um, just in a nod to how we will end our day, like poetry in particular is often you know, known and attributed for being able to do this. Um, but I also feel like the flags, um, you have these two flags, it's sort of like they're speaking to each other. Um, and they have this text on them from these miners, am I right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, first of all, I just have to ask, how did you capture this language? And maybe you would explain uh, to everyone um, who, like, what it was that they were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talked about the video. I said I would talk about the flags after, and then I completely spaced. Didn't talk about the flags at all. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, and, and maybe it's too small to read the text on, like, screens at home. But on the gallery website, you can zoom in enough to actually read it um, if you can't. From where you are um, and yeah they are in conversation these two pieces um, and it's kind of uh, it's found to text um, I did not write it um, and it's a message and it's response uh, call and response uh, where, did, where what are the messages um well <laughs> I don't I don't know how in detail I should get. Um, these well, messages are written by two people who are um, engaging in something called MEV, um, which without explaining it too much, um, it's a uh, somewhat controversial layer of blockchain mining um, that is very, very competitive and adversarial. Um, and these people were both um, competing um, to be the best MEV miner and, or MEV searcher. And the person who is the best MEV searcher will be making the most money. Um, and one of them was retiring and posted this message to the blockchain. Uh, and it's a public message, but because um, of the 
uh, 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 you know, we can tell who wrote a message, we can tell somewhat the, the pseudonymous identity of the uh, author. Um, and it was a retiring message, sharing code, sort of saying farewell to an adversary. Um, and then um, the adversary actually responded as well. And normally at this point of the conversation, I actually just read the message because it's so great. But the tone of these is, is like um, chivalrous. It's like a knight in armor, like um, um, bowing at the end of a joust or something. Um, or like, you know, shaking hands as you get off of the football field. It's almost approaching mentorship. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was really fascinating that this is the tone of the interaction in this environment, which from the outside seems very hostile and very competitive. So this is sort of related to the mirror piece in a way. And this theme, which is through the exhibition as well, this, um, you know, uh, even here, like even here in the heart of competition in blockchain world, we find something else. Mm -hmm. Well, but I actually think that, I mean, this is this interesting place where maybe we can talk a little bit about, you know, both art and technology have, highly competitive and highly collaborative ways of being, right? Um, and, you know, it's a sort of class, I mean, when I read these, there was this, I could almost see the film scene, right? Where it's like, you know, that, that classic moment where I, I feel like there's a moment in heat when um, Al Pacino and uh, I'm blanking on the other guy's name, like they meet, right? And they have this conversation. It's like, they know each other better than anyone else can know either of them because they've been tracking each other because they're, because they are on opposite sides and they're each other's greatest foe. They also know things about each other like no one else does, right? Um, there's something about that that's really interesting. And in you know, as someone who's both an artist and has a background in software engineering, I mean, I have, you know, often been struck by certain types of similarities in behavior, like, and, you know, in the rare interactions I have with engineers, like I'm not involved quite the way you have ever been. Nevertheless, there's a sense of like integrity around what is being designed and developed, right? Like this sort of well, why is it like this? It has to be for like the, the care that goes into it. And it presents as a different type of care than art presents as care, right? But the care for what is being produced is very similar. Um, there's a kind of insistence on the product being uh, well thought out, well produced. Um, which requires a kind of comp comp like willing to be a type of aggressive, right? Because you have to stand up for what you believe in and you have to be willing to strike out the things that aren't good. You want to cultivate people around you who can give you the necessary critical feedback, um, right? And so that breeds a type of like, your, be your best friend can be your worst critic, your best critic too, right? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so anyway, I was just wondering like having found these texts, um, and because you mentioned the mirror, did you find that they mirrored back to you elements of your own experience across art, technology, blockchain, fairs, like the various different spaces in which you've moved in and out of? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a fascinating question. And I have not thought about it. Um, first off, I do really agree that um, art making and engineering are very similar disciplines. Um, I've also worked as a software engineer. Um, and I, I, and obviously as an artist, um, and I, I usually say that it's about building. Both artists mm -hmm. and software developers are fundamentally building things. And the processes and um, metrics that they use for the success of those things um, might be different, um, but there's a lot in common in that in in just the praxis of building itself. Um, and art making is much more technical <laughs> than you might think when you're starting out. <laughs> um, now, in terms of a uh, competition mm, and collaboration, I mean, I think that I mean even outside of art 
or engineering. I think that these um, tensions surround us all the time. Um, we can look at them and see them maybe illustrated in a particularly clear way in certain interactions, like the one on these flags or the interactions of blockchain miners. But um, I think also very relevant to the art market, for example. Um, and the sort of language of game theory is limited in a lot of ways, of course, but it can also be really um, illuminating sometimes. Uh, and one of the texts that this exhibition really draws on is this book called The Evolution of Cooperation by Robert Axelrod. Um, and it's a breakdown of um, a type of game called the Iterated Prisoner's Dilemma, but mm -hmm. it discusses um, the strategies that are effective in that game. And reading about them absolutely made me reflect a lot on the modes with which I'm interacting in a professional context in the art world with peers. Um, one of the, you know, I, <laughs> uh, uh, the, one of the passages from it that made like the biggest impact on me, and I'm always trying to paraphrase for people somewhat unsuccessfully, um, is the most successful strategy overall um, at playing this iterated prisoner's dilemma in the context of the experiments in the book um, is called tit for tat. And the way, but one of the things about it that is so interesting, um, it never actually wins the game mm -hmm. against its opponent. Um, it always allows its opponent to score higher than it does. Um, but overall, um, when playing across many opponents, it has the best performance. It performs well by enabling others to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, and that is really interesting to think about in the context of social dynamics, like the art world, um, or an engineering team, or actually so many environments that we might be working in. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really important. And I think it's, it's so useful um, as a context for this show, in part because um, people love to talk about the prisoner's dilemma, right? And the sort of the difference between this other, you know, between that version and the iterative one is that it's easy to always say like, you want to do, you want to undermine the other person in the prisoner's dilemma, that's the best outcome for you. But in the iterative prisoner's dilemma, and then in the understanding that you will continue to be engaging, that actually completely changes. And it's, in, you know, there's all kinds of economic theories and obviously plenty of political theories around the, that have made use of the prisoner's dilemma. But the problem with them is, is that they act, operate as if they're in a closed box, right? As if there will not be a re-encounter. Um, whereas, um, you know, putting apocalyptic scenarios to the side, like there will be the re-encounter. There will be yet again another diplomatic mission, another conversation to be had with this peer, another um, need to engage. So, and I think it was really, you know, one of the things that struck me about that is how iteration is a term that is used so much in the context of digital art, but is actually so crucial to an, to art, to the, to the practice of art, right? Like the way in which any artist, any writer, any musician will come back to a theme, will come back to certain, like they'll get so far with one show or one part, but like then they have to go back to some element of it that they needed to pursue. Um, and it made me start wondering if, you know, because I do see so much as actually being sort of these like signs of unconscious social needs, right? If part of the reason this conversation around iteration um, had become so important was to sort of emphasize the importance of the fact that we're all constantly iterating. Um, mm -hmm. That is part of the lived experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I wonder, it's such a <laughs> like programmer term, you know, to iterate and a startup term also. 
you know, we talk about um, iterating on your MVP until you find product market fit um, and, and all of that. So I wonder if that's why digital art is using this term so often. I'm sure it is, but it's just interesting to think of it as having these potentially other threads to draw out, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just because I'm, you know, we should keep looking, I wonder if um, we can look at the proof of stake image, which has the um, cable ties. So we have to go back a moment, yeah. But just because part of what you're trying to get at and has been a really important part of the recent conversation in the context of blockchain, and obviously this show is about much more than blockchain. Right. It's about a sort of our networked connectivity and the infrastructures and co connections around that. But proof of stake has been sort of the, lauded as this like ideal alternative to proof of work, right? um, mm -hmm. the mining and energy usage of proof of work. And certainly the environmental impact of proof of work is problematic. And I don't want to suggest otherwise. Um, but proof of stake is the context in which one has to think about these sort of iterative prisoner's dilemma contexts because people are staking. Um, people are putting money in and that's part of what allows them to participate in the game of forging the next block. Um, so I'm just wondering how you put this piece together, like how, how did this piece become the visual form mm -hmm. of, of stake for you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I have to potentially disappoint you here because okay. this piece is not, um, I don't really see this piece as representing that mining algorithm overall. The title is coming really more from a, a little play on the prisoner's dilemma, mm -hmm. um, which is, uh, that's what the grid here is for people who might not know. Um, so there's sort of an image printed on plexiglass and it has a sort of satellite photo. Um, and the satellite photo is a uh, screen cap from the video. Um, and it has uh, 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 this grid on it. And the grid is a rewards matrix of the various payoffs in the prisoner's dilemma. Um, and I kind of used that little glyph throughout the exhibition in a few places. Um, and what is really <laughs> what are the what are they representing they're representing what's at stake in mm -hmm. a way like when we enter into this game um this is this is what's available to to be claimed and so laying it out as a matrix sort of seems like this proof um to me um i guess a few other things mm, the items here are from uh the data center as well. Uh, so the cables and the um, metal grate in the background is a piece of flooring from the data center. Um, and again, these visual motifs are, are being repeated. So we have a lot of grids um, and dots in the exhibition. Um, also fun that the cables are woven through the grid and um, there's an article which I cannot remember the title of because I came across it so long ago, um, but it kind of proposes that we might use the mechanism or the, the metaphor weaving instead of mining um, for the process of creating blocks on a blockchain. And newer blockchains um, sometimes use very different metaphors uh, than Ethereum chose, so, or also Bitcoin, but you know, like Tezos uses baking. Mm -hmm. um, but it kind of talks about the history of weaving in computers. I don't know if people know this, but there's a really strong case to be made that the first computer was actually a weaving loom, mm -hmm. for example. Um, and the art, so this so it kind of like presents as a thought experiment, like what world would we live in if we called the process of making blocks weaving? Mm -hmm. um, and so I was kind of thinking about that when I, when I wove these cables through the grid, I was like, you know, <laughs> What if, <laughs> what if we had an alternative imaginary? Um, but on the subject of proof of stake itself and the transition, actually the merge happened like on the day of the opening or maybe the day before. It was extremely serendipitous timing, but also difficult a little bit to prepare for the exhibition because I didn't know if it would have happened by the time it opened um, or how it would have gone. 
but I will say that I think kind of interestingly, game theoretically speaking, um, both proof of work and proof of stake are functionally iterated prisoner style on my games. Um, in proof of stake, it's a little more obvious um, that we are, that that's what we have, but I think it's also true in proof of work actually. And there are these um, moments uh, that are really telling of this. Um, so someone has actually had in, in the blockchain context, um, when we attack a chain by taking over more than half of the computing resources available, that's called a 51% attack. Um, a, a miner has actually had more than 51% of the hash rate of the Bitcoin network. Um, so this has actually happened, that someone was in a position to take over the network. Um, but what they did is um, not that. Actually, they voluntarily scaled back their operation and they pledged to never have so much again. Hmm. Um, and they encouraged other miners to do the same. And I think that this is very telling because it's a... Um, Sure, we could say cynically, oh, they just didn't think they could cash out in time, um, potentially, but um, I think it's more likely that they recognized that their long-term advantage is actually to continue to run the network um, as designed. Wow, that's a sort of, I, I'm, I'm a little surprised that that story is not better known. Um, I know, <laughs> it was a long time ago that this happened. Um, but people and, like to pick up old stories all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Well, since now I'm intrigued because of the way you're twisting some of these ideas and these titles. Um, I'm wondering if we can look at another one of the grids, Broken Window, um, which is that, yes, that blue one there, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so this one um, is Computer Fans. Um, anyway, uh, I was intrigued by why Broken Window. By the titles? Oh, yeah. the Broken Window title here is, uh, it's maybe hard to tell, but these are clear. These fans are all clear. Um, and this object looks so much like a window to me. Uh, again, it's like got this uh, wooden frame around it. And when it's not powered on, um, it's actually just clear plexiglass fans. Um, and there's a number of computer fans in the show. There's like a whole massive fan sculpture in another part of the exhibition. And um, it's, it's really like, and the fans are kind of twinned with the air filters, right? Um, and I don't know, it just really seemed to me to feel like a broken window, <laughs> um, especially when you put it on the wall and it's not on. Um, and I guess it's um, it's also kind of it's well it's blue and red um, as well. And those fan colors don't change; the fans are just blue and red. Um, but they those colors are kind of meaningful in the exhibition as well. Um, so you'll see uh, blue, red, yellow, and green um, throughout, but more blue and red. Um, and that's because uh, there's sort of a simulation of um, a game theoretical, uh, 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 game theoretical simulation. <laughs> and um, it's using blue and red to represent the strategies of cooperation and, and defection mm. um, as well. So kind of popping up here in grid form um and with the colors as well okay interesting oh i'm very excited to see this um so i'm going to very briefly have a stop on click mine um just because i wanted to mention it um uh so if we could just briefly look at the next slide uh so this was this project it's one of the first ways that i discovered uh sarah friend's work um the basically what, what is fun and bizarre about this experience is that uh, you click and it allows you to mine this piece of soil that you have. And the more you click, um, the deeper you go. And it, it you sort of like own this piece of 
increasing darkness basically so that eventually um, if you're willing to just keep clicking which a surprising number of people do do uh you eventually wind up just surrounded by the dark um do we have a slide of the end state i don't think we do actually um and i'll try to find one but it's it is uh, it, this was one of those moments where I just was so appreciative of the humor in the piece. And um, there's often this association in art and technology that everyone is very serious and is very like self-righteous about both art and technology. Um, and I was just at the time so grateful to find someone who could, who was doing both and appreciated both and could also have a sense of humor about the entire realm of it, including the participants, right? The audience, the users, like how we engage with this stuff and how we participate and therefore are culpable of what it is that keeps being iterated as a part of, you know, a kind of technologized uh, world that we live in. Um, but then I wanted to go to the next one because I, I have to wrap up here. And I just, <laughs> I think it's, um, you know, you just did this piece, Life Forms, which is an NFT in which people needed to hand over the NFT within three months. Um, otherwise, the work would die and the person could not regain it. Um, and so it was a way to sort of undermine some of the economics of, um, you know, speculative trade and this kind of hyped market that had occurred that so many artists themselves have actually tried to like push against because when artists collect other artists, they are often very committed to trying to support each other and like see each other's long-term value come out. Um, but I feel like this show does such a good job, terraforming at least, um, of really speaking to the way in which you've had this environmental interest this whole time. Um, and you've been thinking about the larger sort of terrain as it were, to use more metaphors. Um, and I guess I was just wondering like, do you think, because you have such a strong technology background. Is, is this something that actually comes out of your work with technology? Or is this something that appeared through the art making practice? Um, and I realize they're interrelated, but that commitment, it feels like it comes from one of them. Which commitment specifically? Like this, this concern about the environment and the mm -hmm. material impact of both art and technology. Um, and I was just wondering if those were questions that arose initially when you were working, you know, earning a living, right? Like as a, as a software engineer and doing that with art more this sort of side practice or like whether it became more and more as an artist. Right. Um, I would date that um, to before both actually. Yeah. Um, it's kind of funny. Um, I think that many people work in the tech industry as software developers. And actually, when I went to the data center, this is something that we all, you know, if you work in a data center, you're like, the rest of the tech industry doesn't understand what I do sometimes. And they maybe feel a little unseen. Um, and so we, we talked about how, you know, it's really easy and abstract as a software developer to deploy something in the cloud program and have sort of no sense whatsoever. And your computer arrives to you and it's this packaged the luxury object, basically. Um, so I, I don't think the tech industry, at least for the most part, and from the perspective of an average software developer really um, uh, uh, provides much help there in accessing this question. Um, I do, but I, I mean, it's quite an important one to me personally, um, you know, and maybe a sense, a, a source of anxiety in a few ways. Um, one of them uh, being, you know, um, there's a lot of stories, which are mostly stories, but also not entirely about um, an oppositional tech and nature, you know? Tech is the opposite of nature in a lot of narratives. Um, so what do you do if you're a technologist? How do you grapple with that, um, really? And um, how do you grapple with it, maybe in a way that moves beyond just depicting nature, you know, in the work and using technology? So that's a question I ask myself a lot and I don't really have an answer to. Um, 
but I also think working in the cryptocurrency industry, which is um, where I've worked for a long time, it's been quite important or di difficult to ignore um, this aspect of the conversation. You know, um, it's kind of the first thing people ask you about for a really long time. Um, like what, how do you live with yourself? Your industry has such a huge climate impact, you know? Um, and people will ask me like the questions on panels like this. Um, and I guess I also want to say like, I'm from Canada. And I think that that actually maybe is part of why I think about this stuff the way I do. I don't know if people who aren't Canadian really know this, but uh, like resource extraction is a huge part of the conversation in Canada. Um, I mean everywhere, but it's a pretty big chunk of the Canadian economy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and being critical of that is uh, very common in um, the communities I was part of back when I lived there. Um, like, for example, I don't know if people know this, but I don't talk about it so much when I talk about the work, but in ClickMine, like many of the items that you can buy as power-ups are actually um, real, um, machines used at the tar sands in Alberta. Hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um, no, thank you for that. I think it's, uh, I, you know, I sort of implied it at the beginning when I was mentioning this thing I was teaching with my students. Um, one of the, to me, one of the great advantages of what's happened with tech recently has, or with you know, art and technology coming to so much attention, has been that it's also forced this conversation around environmental concerns, um, and allowed people to sort of take on more recognition of their culpability, right? Of the fact that everyone is culpable, right? We can't own the devices that we're using right now without um, being a part of a system that we also need that needs to be put into question and therefore needs to have more work about it to help us sort of think through where are the ways in, where are the ways of potential change, where are the, where are the breaking points that can take us somewhere new. Um, Sarah, I have a million more questions for you, but it's <laughs> not my turn anymore. Um, I got to raise my hand over and over and over again in this last hour. So um, it's my turn to hand it over to the audience um, and let them ask you questions. And thank you so much. Oh, thank you also. It's been my pleasure to uh, try to answer them. <laughs> thank you so much, Charlotte and Sarah. That was an incredible conversation. And I really enjoyed just the two of you speaking so eloquently about the work and the exhibition in Berlin. So thank you. Um, uh, we do have a question from GE in the audience. So GE, I'm going to ask you to unmute here. Thank you very much, Chloe, and thank you, Charlotte and, and, and Sarah. Um, maybe I'm more philosophical here. Um, in, in a world where nothing is really known or can be known beyond the um, known to be unspeakable, only metaphor speaks literally and literal speech itself is a metaphor. Isn't that the rise of this archeology span of the present? Is that a question for me? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> oh, I don't know where to begin with that question. But I love what you said of only only metaphor speaks literally and um and literal speech is a metaphor. Um and uh, similarly, uh the sort of image of an archaeology of the present, because I think that maybe that's what um well, that's a way of putting what I think I was trying to do with some of the things in this exhibition, or maybe a good like um, way of thinking about a modality for art making. Um, what's coming to mind, which is not really an answer because that's such a big question, I don't know how to answer it, but uh, <laughs> um, what's coming to mind is something that's just uh, a little bit maybe related to what Charlotte and I were talking about towards the end as well, which is this opposition between uh, nature and technology. Like one of my biggest obsessions that totally does not come out in the work yet, but is the thinking about language as a technology? Because it is, of course. And I sometimes like to say like language is the er technology. It's like the first technology maybe, or it has a good case to be made. Um, and so 
you know, we can also ask ourselves, like, what are the affordances of the language technology? As much as we could ask ourselves, like, what are the affordances of the blockchain? So thank I you for your question. I'm not sure that was, no. a, that was a try. <laughs> Absolutely. No, thank you. That's exactly where I was going, especially the er part of it. So thank you so much. I have to pop in here just, I'm so sorry, I know I'm not supposed to, but I can't help myself. Um, just to say, you know, it's, I'm always reminded of the fact, and I've been trying to talk more about, you know, uh, often with, with technology, there's this kind of like um, naturalism that, like, that arises where people have this sort of like utopic, everyone should go back to farming. If we were all just working the land, the world would be better. And um, so actually, when the last time I gave an art and technology talk, I was sort of like, I'm going to start 10,000 years ago with the agricultural revolution, um, because the agricultural revolution really starts, it establishes property, it establishes power, it establishes status, it establishes a whole set of mechanisms that make it possible for people to be artists and athletes and kings and musicians and that produces guilds and libraries and army like right like there's this whole thing that then sort of unfurls because of that and the industrial revolution was in response to the scarcity of land that had occurred because of the agricultural revolution and I think in many ways what we're dealing with now with technology what we call technology as if nothing previously had been but computers is like dealing with the scarcity that's been produced by the uh industrial revolution and so really like when we try and go back to this sort of like you know nature is is this better other thing we actually undermine the work that needs to happen which is to recognize one we are of nature all of this is of nature and two that we are where we are because of things that happened so long ago and um there isn't a back that we can go to and so we have to think through what are the choices we made along the way in order to make good choices now for a future we can also like not necessarily imagine thank you so very very much te thank you so much for that question um and thank you sarah and charlotte for those answers the last question is going to come from me um Sarah, I'm curious if you had to give your audiences one question to have in the back of their mind as they view your current exhibition at Nagel Draxler, what would it be? I only get one question. Okay, the really obvious one is, is the world fundamentally based upon a principle of cooperation or competition? It's like definitely my obvious pick. Um, but I wanna ask another question that uh, I think is maybe related, not so completely to the exhibition, but maybe to what Charlotte was saying. Um, which came up all the time in the reading. I read the book that the quote um, on the mirror piece by the door is from with a reading group and it was something we talked about um, all the time um, in, in that reading group is, is uh, and also maybe like related to the exhibition a little bit, which has to do with like a directionality, especially that piece, Shadow of the Future. Um, so how do we go back to the land and forward into the future at the same time? Mm -hmm. Like, is returning to a more just ecological relationship always the process of going backward? And what would it look like if it wasn't? Mm -hmm. So not about the exhibition, more about what Charlotte said, but you know, you have two questions. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you again for this amazing conversation today. Thank you everyone for joining today. And, you know, at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our NSC events with a poetry reading. And it's my pleasure to welcome Eleni Sigulianos uh, as our poet laureate of the day. Um, and I'm going to introduce Eleni here. One moment.
Born in California on Walt Whitman's birthday, Eleni Sicilianos is a poet, writer, and a master of mixing genres. She grew up in earshot of the ocean in small coastal towns near Santa Barbara and has lived in San Francisco, New York, Paris, Athens, Boulder, and Providence. Deeply engaged with eco-poetics, her work takes up urgent concerns of environmental precarity and ancestral lineages. Your Kingdom will be her 10th book of poetry, writing alongside two memoir verse image novels. Thank you so much for reading with us today, Eleni. Thank you so much, Chloe, for inviting me. And thank you to Charlotte and Sarah. That was so fascinating and illuminating and so in worlds that um, I don't know very much about. And it was just, I loved hearing all the ways that it actually touches on the work that I um, am deeply engaged in without me realizing it. Um, yeah, just brilliant. I, I hope to hear more conversation from both of you. And, and it's just, it's so fitting because actually I was gonna read from the opening long poem of the title poem of Your Kingdom. And part of what I was doing, the um, piece, which is about 55 pages long and I don't be frightened. I'm just gonna read a little excerpt. Um, was was um, instigated by watching a salamander crawl over a log about eight years ago and thinking of, about from my zoology classes, just remembering that we have shoulder girdles and hip girdles because amphibians invented them and thinking about all these other animal technologies that we're carrying around in our bodies all the time and wanting to honor that, um, having written uh, a book that was deeply engaged in eco grief, wanting to have eco joy, um, but also thinking about, I'm, I'm very influenced by the biologist Lynn Margulis, who was the, the um, biologist who really brought to the fore the notion of symbiogenesis, that um, cooperative acts and species mergers were a huge driving force in evolution, not just competition. So um, taking sort of um, pushing back on the neo-Darwinists um, that, that all evolution comes through competition. And, and then her, you know, she was of course laughed at and so forth and all her theories were proved correct now that um, you know, we're able to do um, genome sequencing and we see that mitochondria are actually two different kinds of species who've merged. So yeah, cooperation and competition. So I'm gonna read the opening section of um, your kingdom and of course thinking about you know what kingdom brings to mind animal kingdoms and and beyond and then we'll see if there's time i might read one other poem if you like let the body feel all its own evolution inside opening flagella and feathers and fingers door by door a ragged neuron dangling like a participle to hear a bare sound. On the path, find a red eye hole rabbit, fat of the bulbous stalk pecked out to the core. A raptor did that. So you can bore back to the salamander you once were straggling under the skin. Grope toward the protozoa, snagging on the rise toward placental knowing. Who developed eyes for you agape in open waters? The worm that made a kidney-like chamber burrows in, directing your heart leftward in nodal cascade, slow at your hagfish spine. Who will bury your bones, investigate a redwood rain, or tap the garnet of your heartwood bark? Put your flat needles on dry ice to inquire after your tree family, father or mother in the fairy ring next to you, find you are most closely related to grass if you are a redwood. Your hexaploid breathing pores gently closing at night. When did you begin your coexistence with flowering plants from which arose the bee before the African honey badger, but after the dark protoplanetary disk of dust grains surrounding the sun become the earth? You had no nouns, did you? 
feel the gravitational sorting in the pre-long graphite as it marked toward tissue, the split in prokaryotes when ether lipids did you no good, but still you learned to unleash energy, breaking, making bonds, and how some ancient groping grains in your gut foraging on gases, and who knows what phototraffic algae did, karate chopping water splitting, to feed on sunlight, and thus you can eat an apple after bacon, benefiting from the invention of glucose storage, but the rugged sex life of the hermaphroditic banana slug nipping at its partner's current penis. Later, it's a vagina in liquid crystal slime has little to do with you, yet you can watch it and wonder at the structure of your own snot's likeness to its plural wetnesses. Now that you have learned to traffic phonemes plus genes in their own bio chassis delivery system, glot will stop in your sit e or button made possible by obstructed airflow when your organs made for eating began to cry out the tongue in torsion to express your thought. And it was strange how you altered your formant frequencies and I becomes a you around the fire you switch to pure sound in the dark, and I know what you mean. I think I'll end there, yeah. Wow, thank you so much, Lenny. That was amazing. Thank you. That was such an incredible conclusion to this event. Uh, and thank you again to Sarah and to Charlotte. We, of course, also like to thank the Terra Foundation who sponsor this NSC program and make these daily conversations possible. And for their support of our growing archive, you can view today's event and our full archive on the Rails YouTube channel. For 22 years, the Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events, like here on our daily NSC. You can check the chat for a link to donate to support the writers, editors, and operations here at the Rail. And if you're free on Monday at 1 p.m., join us for a conversation with Zoe Leonard, Tim Johnson, Thursa Nichols Goodeve, and Esther Gabara on the occasion of Al Rio to the River at Musée d'Art Moderne in Paris. We'll conclude with a poetry reading by Josephine Chakrian. And you can now turn on your microphone and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much for joining us today and happy Friday, everyone. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you so I much. Am. And go see the show if you're in Berlin or <laughs> see a reading by Eleni and Monica de la Torre at Amal Foundation in January as well. So many great events happening. Um, yeah. Thank Sarah, you all. Thank Bye -bye. you, everyone. Thank you Have all. lovely weekends. <laughs> Bye.